welcome back. It's been another week of announcements. So most notably with the Acoustic Sounds Verve series, they announced their calendar for the year. And then we just got the record store day drops like not more than an hour or two ago. And so I wanna tackle both, but not in the same video. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with Acoustic Sounds because I've had at least a day to prepare for that. Um, so, so that's what we're gonna do. There's actually 20 releases that they've slated for the year, including one that actually just came out like um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but I'll, I'll cover that as well, just to make sure that you're aware. So um, as always, before we dive into it, please go ahead and hit uh, hit like, subscribe to my channel if this is the type of content that you like to uh, to, to see on a regular basis. And then um, if you if you can't get enough and you want more, you can head over to Instagram. You can follow me at what underscore can underscore brown. So Chad Kasim from Acoustic Sounds just put out his own YouTube video, which I will link in the description, where he ran down all 20 releases. So why do I need to do the same thing? Well, um, Chad is pretty, uh, he's pretty brief about each of the releases, doesn't doesn't really provide that much um, information about the release in terms of if it's something that Acoustic Sounds has tackled before, if it's something that Vinyl Me Please has tackled before. And then one thing that he's certainly not going to do because he's, you know, he owns this business is he's, he's not going to provide any type of, um, you know, indication on sort of, you know, whether each of these titles merit the treatment, right? Are they deserving of the uh, of the reissue or are they are they ones that you should be particularly excited about because he's going to be excited about all of them because he gets to choose the uh, the lineup. What I'm going to do is kind of give you a little bit of my opinion on some of these as well because I do not think that all of these uh, merit the treatment and therefore the $40 ish price. Um, so so that, that's what we're going to do, but I am also going to try to keep this brief because 20 releases is a lot to cover. As, not always, but I, I'm trying to do this more and more. I'm adding chapter uh, separators in between each of the, um, well, it, throughout my videos. So if you want to skip ahead to say, you know, hear what I think about a particular release, then you can do that. You just have to go down to the description and check the uh, the chapter separations, okay? All right, so a couple of unifying characteristics across each of these 20 releases. So these are all, all analog, right? So they're AAA releases. They are not all mastered by the same mastering engineer. So I can't say that there's one that is um, that is gonna be the case across, across the entire list. Um, but these are 180 gram pressings. They are pressed at QRP. They all are gonna have stout and tip on jackets. And they're all gonna be priced at $38 and 98 cents. So the first one up that they uh, that Chad referenced in his video is Soulville. This was originally put out in 1958, and it's a title that I've uh, brought forward on my channel before because I had a whole video just on Ben Webster's releases, and because I'm a huge Ben Ben Webster fan. So um, the interesting thing about this entire list of 20 is that if there's any musician who is represented the most, it's got to be. Ben Webster. So good news for me and good news for all of us who are uh, who are Ben Webster fans. So um, this one was just put out a couple of weeks ago on January 26th and I have considered getting the uh, the Acoustic Sounds edition because I'm really excited about uh, about obviously Ben Webster but Soulville is one of my absolute favorite titles that he ever put out. And so you know, this is one that I that I have a lot of energy for. Now, this one was recently released. Well, I say recent. It was released by Vinyl Me Please in 2014. Barely even knew that there were a company back then. It was their record of the month. I don't know which month it was. Um, and then it was actually repressed by VMP in 2016. And there was a moment in time where I actually owned that copy. And I inevitably sold it because I liked this original. Well, this is a second edition. I like the second edition better. Um, this also has been put out by Acoustic Sounds in the past. In fact, it was in the Analog Production series. It came in a double 45 RPM format that was put out in 2013. So this one has received more modern quality reissues, but um, I, you know, it has been a while. And so I suppose you can't really fault Acoustic Sounds for wanting to include it. So on this album, including Ben Webster, we have Ray Brown, Stan Levy, Herb Ellis, and Oscar Peterson. And it's a really great lineup. It's a quintet format so it's not going to be super dense orchestral and this thing is just classic so I, I have nothing bad to say about this one I think Chad did a great job picking this for the series all right so the next one coming up is I would say a curious title so this is Stan Getz and Bill Evans 
Um, this is coming out on February 23rd, and it is going to be mastered by Ryan K. Smith. So what to say about this? Why is it a curious release? Well, the material was recorded in 1964, and yet it was shelved. It was first released in 1973 on, well, really in any format. Um, so how this falls in terms of the Bill Evans discography is that this is in between the Trio 1964 album that was put out on Verve and the Bill Evans Trio Live, which is that kind of like... Um, like dark blue cover that was sort of like stylized script. And that was also put out on Verb, uh, Verve. And so that was 1964 as well. Uh, this particular title has not had a vinyl release in the US since that very first edition, I believe again, 1973, 1974. That original is not particularly expensive, um, but that doesn't have anything really to do with the quality of the music, in my opinion. I think it's the sort of the fact that it has a, a less inspired cover. Now, Acoustic Sounds is going to continue to use that cover because I suppose that's what the original is, and so they're trying to maintain that. Um, if it were me, and or if it was like a Tone Poet release, and given kind of the scenario, I would take the opportunity to, uh, to redo it. Um, but I mean, here's here's the thing. Like I said, it's 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 not particularly expensive. Um, maybe the same price, or maybe even a little bit less than what this Acoustic Sounds uh, edition is going to go for. So probably around that thirty-five to forty dollar mark is what you could get an original for. But I would say even as most even as recently as five years ago, or maybe even as recent as before this announcement, you could get one of these for like ten dollars or less. Um, it just wasn't particularly desirable. But it is good music. It is exciting to hear uh, Bill Evans and Stan Getz together. And so obviously Bill Evans always has a lot of attention around all of his releases. And I, you know, I think we've seen when some of these reissue labels decide to prioritize otherwise glossed over work, stuff that people don't necessarily care about, all of a sudden people care a lot about it. Um, and so that's probably what's going to happen here as well. Am I going to get this one? No, I'm not. Um, and it, it isn't because I don't love Bill Evans and it isn't because I don't appreciate the music that's on this one, but I've got a lot of Bill Evans, don't have time to listen to all the stuff that I already have. And so I am uh, skipping this one. Coming up in March, in fact, March 29th, is Ella Fitzgerald, and the album is Clap Hands, Here Comes Charlie. Uh, so this edition is going to be mastered by Bernie Grunman. It was originally, the album was originally put out in 1971, and the lineup includes Stan Levy, Herb Ellis, Lou Levy, and Joe Mondragon. So this was put out by Analog Productions, which is, you know, the Acoustic Sounds outfit, in 2012 in a double 45 RPM format. That one was mastered by George Marino at Sterling Sound. There was also a 1994 release by Classic Records, and I believe that that one may have been mastered by Bernie Grunman, which makes you think that they may be using those Classic Records parts for this. And that is a characteristic actually across this uh, list of 20, is that when there was a Classic Records release, it turns out that Acoustic Sounds is going to be reusing those metal parts from that mastering for this new one. So is it necessarily a new treatment or like a new mastering? No. However, a lot. It, first of all, it's been a long time since some of those Classic Records were put out. Again, a lot in the, uh, the mid-90s. Um, but also, if they did a good job, then why not reuse it? Does it really matter? Uh, and I can't, I can't really answer that because I don't know. <laughs> I've never heard the, uh, the Classic Records release of this. Um, so in terms of this record, an original in decent shape costs about $25. Um, but this is what I will say about that. Acoustic Sounds does you know, a really good job with this entire series, but there's a big difference, especially when it comes to albums with vocals. Uh, I find that there's a huge difference between the originals and the Acoustic Sounds editions, and so, and, and that typically the Acoustic Sounds editions blow the originals out of the water. And I think a good example of that is Ella and Lewis uh, that they put out, what, like a year or two ago. So, um, you know, it, would I necessarily advocate that you should go after an original instead of the acoustic sounds? Not necessarily if what you're looking for is the best sound possible. I have full confidence that acoustic sounds is going to do a great job with this release. And I may consider getting it um, because more and more I've been getting back into jazz vocals and, um, you know, there's few have done it better than, uh, than Ella Fitzgerald. So the release for April, in fact, April 26th, is Jerry Mulligan's Night Lights. 
So this edition is going to be mastered by Ryan K. Smith. Um, the album was originally put out in 1963, and there was one early reissue, like a couple of years later, in the U.S., and then nothing else in the in on vinyl in the U.S. Um, however, New Land just uh, just put out actually a reissue of this a couple of years ago. So New Land is a label based out of the U.K. Uh, and so they put out their release in 2021. That edition was mastered by Kevin Gray. So if if uh, Acoustic Sounds is going to be using Ryan K. Smith, obviously this is going to be different. Um, and will it be better? I don't know. Do we really need another edition just a couple of years after New Lands? I know not everybody had the opportunity to get New Lands. Uh, and I know that edition sounded great. I personally have in a, an original of this. And so I don't, um, I don't necessarily know if I'm going to pick this up, but here's the thing. This album is just um, more and more difficult to find and more and more appreciated as the years go on. And so I know there's going to be a ton of energy for it. Uh, on this album, you have Bill Crow, Dave Bailey, Jim Hall, Bob Brookmeyer, and Art Farmer. So it is a little bit of a larger group, but um, there is something magical, uh, magical about this music. Um, I... I understand why they'd want to include it, and I understand that Acoustic Sounds is not afraid of putting out releases so soon after another reissue. We've seen that time and time again with The Love Supreme and others, so um, so it isn't surprising that they're including it. Um, but you know, I don't necessarily know if I need it. I'm probably going to wait and hear what other people say. So the May release is Kenny Burrell's Guitar Forms. Now, I know a lot of people are gonna see Kenny Burrell and say, oh, I absolutely have to get that because in their mind they have his work for Blue Note in their heads or, or whatever. Uh, and don't get me wrong, Kenny Burrell is great really across labels, but um, it did have a tendency to get into a little bit more sort of denser or orchestrated stuff and, and sometimes a little bit more commercial uh, after he left Blue Note, and so that's something to be aware of. So this release, um, let's see, it's, it's being mastered by Ryan K. Smith. The album was originally put out in 1965, which was kind of that period of time where a lot of folks, and especially guitarists, and I'm thinking Wes Montgomery, Grant Green, certainly uh, Kenny Burrell, were going more into um, denser stuff, more commercial stuff, not necessarily with the best results. So who do we have on this record? It's Lee Konitz, Joe Benjamin, Elvin Jones, Ron Carter, Willie Rodriguez, Charles Persip, Grady Tate, Julius Watkins, Richie Kamuka, Steve Lacey, Jimmy Nepper, Louis Mucci, Johnny Coles, among others. This is a big group. Now, one thing that this recording has going for it is that originally it was recorded by Rudy Van Gelder. And so, um, you know, Acoustic Sounds doesn't have a ton of opportunities, I suppose, in their Verve series of addressing Rudy Van Gelder, uh, Rudy Van Gelder pressings. Few opportunities on Verve, certainly anything that they want to do from, uh, from Impulse. But that may be reason enough to be interested in picking this up. But here's the thing. An original costs like $10, and five years ago you could find them in the dollar bin all day and all night. I've been ignoring this album for years, never owned a copy. Is the decision by Acoustic Sounds to put it in their, in their lineup a reason why everyone should run out and try to get this when otherwise they've been ignoring it? People will, but not me. Um, I've uh, I've previewed this. It's it's a little bit too dense for me, and um, I'm just going to prioritize you know my spend probably elsewhere. Despite the fact that this hasn't had a U.S. final reissue ever, to my knowledge. So as many copies as you may have seen out there in record stores, theoretically there shouldn't be that many <laughs> because it only had that uh, that single pressing. Back to Back by Duke Ellington and Johnny Hodges is going to be put out on May 24th. This is my original stereo. Absolutely love the cover. It was designed by Burt Goldblatt, and I think it's uh, I think it's fantastic. So um, what Acoustic Sounds has said is that they are using the Classic Records parts, which were mastered by uh, Bernie Grunman. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, I guess, chronology, so this was put out in 1959 originally. That Classic Records reissue was in 1995. So that's when Bernie Grunman did that, uh, did that remastering. Then it was released by Analog Productions in 2012 in a double 45 RPM format. And that version was mastered by George Marino at Sterling Sound. Um, so it has had a couple of reissues. They are going back to the mid 90s for the parts on this thing. Um, but, you know, let's be real, N not only are both of those editions supposedly fantastic, they've also gone up in price, and it turns out the, the original music is fantastic. I know a lot of people see Duke Ellington and Johnny Hodges, and they think Snooze Fest, and when I say a lot of people, I mean probably more 
I don't know, the, uh, the, the sort of folks who are newer to the hobby who haven't yet sort of gone back and, and uh, actually had to listen to some of this stuff because a lot of this stuff is just incredibly inspired and I think this is one of my favorite, this is definitely one of my favorite Duke Ellington or Johnny Hodges albums that's out there. Um, so this is a uh, sort of a smaller format. You look at this and you think, oh, it's the Duke Ellington Orchestra. It's not. It is uh, Duke and Johnny, but then you also have Joe Jones, Les Spann, and Harry Edison. Um, and I think that that is it. Let me see if there's any. Oh, there's Al Hall on bass as well. Um, oh, and there's a different lineup. Okay, so there's two different lineups uh, where they swap out uh, where they swap out the bassist. That's what it is. So. Um, in any event, it is a small lineup, it is more intimate, and the music is fantastic. And so I am kind of excited about this. Will it be enough to make me navigate away from my original stereo for a Duke Ellington and Johnny Hodges record? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to wait and see. It's probably going to be dependent on what else is coming out in May of this year. All right, so on June 14th, we have Billie Holiday's Body and Soul. This is a pretty exciting one for me. So um, it's being mastered by Ryan K. Smith. Um, and this is a weird title because there was like absolutely nothing in between its original release in 1957 and 1977 when it was released in Japan. So this is 20 year, this odd 20 year gap. The first U.S. reissue of it was by MoFi in 1995, then Analog Productions put one out in double 45 RPM format in 2011, which was mastered by George Marino. Um, so this is a, it's a scarce record, okay? Um, and the fact that it's Billie Holiday is incredibly exciting. I've listened to digital tracks only of this record. I actually found an original just this week in a store, and yet it was in terrible shape, as, as, often, as often this record uh, seems to be. Um, and so I'm, having heard the digital tracks, I'm really excited for this. This is one that I mentioned I'm getting back into uh, to jazz vocals, and I think that this is one to get. I mean, Billie Holiday sounds fantastic on this. Um, she's supported by Alvin Stoller, uh, Barney Kessel, Jimmy Rawls, uh, Larry Bunker, Sweets Edison, and Ben Webster. So Ben Webster uh, sneaks in on this thing. And um, I have to say, I'm here for it. I'm really excited about this one. This is one I'm definitely going to pre-order. So we have more Johnny Hodges coming up on June 28th with his album, Blues Aplenty. So the mastering engineer on this is Bernie Grunman, and they are leveraging the classic records release parts. Um, so originally put out in 1958, it did have a 1995 reissue by Classic Records, uh, and then a 2013 reissue by Analog Productions in 45 RPM format, which was mastered again by George Marino. So they're going back to these earlier remasterings for some of these reissues, um, possibly because, here's the thing, I'm not a, um, I don't know enough about the process. It's possible that they're going back to classic because those masterings were done for 33, whereas George Marino's were done for 45. I don't know that that makes a huge difference, but maybe it does. Otherwise, you'd think that they would go, uh, just go back to uh, to what they used under their own, well, their own outfit, Analog Productions, but uh, but they're not doing that. So kind of curious, maybe somebody out there has more information than I. Um, so in terms of this album, it is really great music, and it is also ignored because it's Johnny Hodges, and he's a little bit out of, um, you know, he's not in vogue, I suppose, uh, with a lot of, uh, you know, sort of collectors these days. Um, the lineup on this record includes Jimmy Woods, Sam Woodyard, Billy Strayhorn, Ben Webster again, Vic Dickinson, and Roy Eldridge. So for those keeping score, there's a lot of Ben Webster already, and there's definitely more to come. You can you can tell that Chad Kasim loves Ben Webster, and again, fortunately, I do as well. Um, is this going to be one that I'll pick up? Probably not. Um, I'm I'm more excited about some of the other releases in this uh, in this calendar. I have owned a copy of this, and I do remember enjoying it, but inevitably, I got rid of it. And I don't necessarily know that just because we have a new edition is, is another reason to, uh, or is a, is a good enough reason for me to go out and, and rebuy it. All right, July 12th, we've got Sonny Stitt Plays the Blues. So this was recorded in 1960. Um, and then it had, so more recently in terms of audiophile reissues, it did have that classic records release in 1995, as I keep saying with a lot of these titles. Um, that one was mastered by Bernie Grunman, and guess what? They are reusing that mastering for this release. 
Um, this also did have a double 45 release in 2013 by Analog Productions, um, but again, they're going back to the classic parts. So this is an interesting album. I would say that it's one of Sonny Stitt's more inspired records. I am not a huge Sonny Stitt fan, and it's for a couple of reasons that are perhaps controversial. One is that supposedly he informed on um, other musicians' drug use and got them arrested in order for him, in, in order for him to be able to uh, avoid his own sentence. And then the other is that I think that um, to some degree, some of his records feel a little bit like derivative, like he was trying to be a little bit too much of a sort of copy of others and, and wasn't necessarily advancing music on his own. I know, here's the thing, like these are, these are like, you know, sort of my own, you know, sort of preferences or like, I don't know how I, how I, uh, what I've heard, I guess, in some of his music. And it's not fair to say that that's the case across his entire body of work. I happen to think that Sonny Stitt Plays the Blues is one of his more inspired records. So at least, at least there's that. But I also don't own very much Sonny Stitt and that's by intention or choice. Uh, so this one is a small format. You've got uh, Leroy Vinegar, Lou Levy, and uh, and Mel Lewis. So it's that quartet format as Sonny Stitt often found himself. He didn't often record with multiple horns. It was typically him in a rhythm section. Um, so, you know, ahead of making this video, I did listen to a couple tracks and I, I have to admit it, uh, it does sound pretty good. You know, Sonny Stitt could definitely play. Um, am I gonna pick this up? No, I'm not. Um, for some of those aforementioned reasons. And um, I don't know, it's just, uh, just because it's being reissued doesn't necessarily make me a completist with all these things. All right, so also in July, we have Jerry Mulligan meets Ben Webster. Um, so this is originally recorded in 1958, finally released in 1960. And one of the things that Chad brings up is that there's multiple cover versions of this record. And so I'll show you the, I'll show you the other cover. Uh, what Chad indicated in the video is that they are very likely going to go with this cover and they may leverage that alternate cover for the inside gatefold or possibly for the reverse. So people are going to be able to get a sense of both covers. I think a lot of people say technically the other cover is the first one and this one is the second one, but this one more, I would say, closely matches the rest of the aesthetic of Verve and more closely matches the other releases of Ben Webster in all of these so-and-so meets Ben Webster form formats because there's a bunch of them. Um, but all of this is pending and, and who knows what they're going to end up going with. And, and I can't really comment. I mean, I really like this uh, this cover version, but you know, wh whichever, right? So the lineup on this record is uh, Leroy Vinegar, Mel Lewis, Jimmy Rawls, uh, plus Ben Webster and Jerry Mulligan. This did have a 2018 reissue by Analog Productions. It had a MoFi edition in 1995. It had a Speaker's Corner edition in 2006. It had an ORG release in 2010. Um, whatever, it's a uh, it's a great album, and um, the fact that they're going to be uh, remastering this for for the series, I think, is great news. And because I love Ben Webster so much, and most importantly, because my copy is not in the best shape, I'm definitely going to get this. I think it's uh, I just think it's really exciting. I love the combination of uh, Jerry Mulligan's baritone sax with Ben Webster's tenor. I just think that there's so much um, sort of character and dynamic range on this, and so uh, I'm a big fan. I'm I'm adding this to my to my pre-order list. All right, so August 16th, we have an impulse title. So you'll note that um, Acoustic Sounds didn't feel like they had their impulse series. And then they also had their Verve series, but now they're including Impulse titles in their Verve series. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they didn't have an Impulse series and they just had like a string of Impulse titles all at once, but it feels like they're shying away from the Impulse and they're leaning more into uh, into Verve and then folding everything into it. But anyway, um, the, uh, the next title on August 16th, Sonny Rollins' East Broadway Rundown. Um, this is going to be mastered by Ryan K. Smith. Um, it was originally released, this edition is 1967. It was put out again a few times, but at least in modern history, let's see, it was released in 1995. It was again in 2009, but I believe that both, or at least one of them, maybe both were Scorpio reissues that were sourced from digital. So this really is a little bit of a net new kind of thing. The lineup on here is pretty impressive. You have uh, Elvin Jones and Jimmy Garrison, and then I believe that Freddie Hubbard plays on just one track, but I say just one track, I think it's track one, which takes up the entire first side. So he's very much a part of the lineup, but otherwise it's Sonny Rollins in kind of a, uh, in kind of a trio format. 
This one is going to be exciting for a lot of people. It is a great album. It is worthy of a reissue, especially a quality one. And so I think I think um, out of everything that we've tackled thus far, I think this is going to be one of the better selling titles. Um, Sonny Rollins has been getting a lot more energy in terms of reissues lately. I think that's bringing a lot of people to his music. And um, and I just think that this is a uh, it's a great choice. So. I here's the thing my approach with these impulse ones is I did buy a few even though I almost always have the original pressing I did buy a few and typically they do sound better but not necessarily better enough such that I feel like I need both and because I'm not getting rid of my original pressings unless they're in bad shape uh, I mean, I'm, pr I'm probably not going to pick this up in the Acoustic Sound series, but it, but it's not because it doesn't deserve it, and it's not because I, I know it's going to sound great and probably better than the original. It's that I don't need both, and um, I don't even want to put myself in the situation where both start like sitting on the shelves because because I just don't have I don't have the space, I don't have the time to listen to both. Like that's just where I stand. But for those of you who don't own this record and have been waiting for either an original or an opportunity to get a quality reissue. I think this is a, uh, I think it's just a, a, a great choice. All right, so the second one in August is on August 30th, and this is Stan Getz's Sweet Rain. This is going to be mastered by Ryan K. Smith as well. Um, so originally put out in 1967, and the lineup is, uh, is pretty unusual and impressive. It's Ron Carter, Grady Tate, Chick Cor uh, Corea, or Corea, never know, and um, it was originally recorded by Rudy Van Gelder, which is very, very interesting. This one has never had a reissue in the U.S. on vinyl ever. Um, the record in its original form, its original that original pressing from 1967, is still um, you know reasonably inexpensive. I think you can get a, a nice quality copy for $25 online, like on Discogs. Um, and I will say that this is surprisingly nice music. So when I think about late 60s Stan Getz, I think of maybe him getting into like just a little bit too syrupy, um, you know, almost like easy listening kind of stuff. But if you think about who's like in that lineup, you know that that's not what it's going to be. And it was recorded by Rudy Van Gelder. Um, I've only listened to this uh, this album and it's in a digital form. This is one that because of my lack of familiarity with it and because of sort of the credentials of who's on this thing and Rudy Van Gelder, this is one that like, I don't own that much Stan Getz, but this is one that I, that I think I may pick up. I, I think personally that this type of, this type of record has all the hallmarks of something that acoustic sounds could do just a really, really nice stereo treatment, right? That's gonna like, you know, really sing as an audiophile release. And so I'm, um, this is just an unusual buy for me. I don't think, I think I, I wouldn't have even expect myself to get that excited about this one, and yet I have. So I'm likely gonna pick this up. I would encourage folks to, uh, to preview it, but I think if you preview it, all, all it's gonna do is make you wanna get it more. All right, next up on September 6th is Nina Simone in concert. So this was originally put out by Philips, and it's in their Verve series. Well, we've seen that they are pulling uh, titles in from, from a variety of places, right? So the mastering is by Ryan K. Smith. It was originally recorded live in 1964. I don't think that this has had a modern vinyl reissue, um, at least not that I could find. And I will say that this is fantastic. Like, Nina Simone is fantastic, but hearing her in a live format where she feels like a little bit less, a little bit more like unencumbered, I think is really exciting. This was um, sort of, you know, around the time where she, she was singing more stuff that was, you know, more like, I don't want to say just protest music, um, but she was incorporating more of that into her, into her repertoire. Um, she does have a, uh, a rendition of I Loves You Porgy on this. She has uh, Mississippi Goddamn, which is the, uh, which is the last track and it's fantastic. Um, but I, I think, I think that this is just a great choice. It's really, really good. And there, I mean, there's a reason why I tracked down this copy, which happens to be an original mono promo copy. Um, so what I'm going to do, I think, because sometimes I'm skeptical with live recording, like reissues of live recordings is I'm probably going to wait and hear what other people say and then determine, do I want to keep this original mono or do I want to sell this and get the, well, gosh, I assume that they're doing a stereo reissue for this, um, uh, in acoustic sounds, but I'm interested in what they do, I guess, with the, um, 
you know, with with this uh, with this remastering, and and whether they're able to make you know extract, I guess, something more from this, considering it's a live session. So I'm going to wait and see on this. But um, for those of you who don't own a copy of this, I mean, this is just phenomenal music. So September and October um, are both the months for vocalists. So you know, if you follow, we just had uh, Nina Simone. Well, the second one in September is Sarah Vaughn's Sassy. Uh, so this was originally recorded in 1956. Uh, the remastering is being done by Ryan K. Smith. She is backed up on this record by Harold Mooney and his orchestra. For some of these, uh, for some of these Sarah Vaughn titles, and even Ella Fitzgerald, it almost doesn't matter who's in the lineup because oftentimes they have these like sort of almost nameless orchestras that are behind them. Um, this album is, I would say it's an unusual choice. You don't, I'll say that you don't typically see this like anywhere. Like usually you're not going to come across this album in a record store, even in any condition. And it hasn't had a modern reissue since the sixties in the U S on vinyl. So I suppose that we could say that it's due for one. Is this her best work? No, but is it exciting to really get any Sarah Vaughn, especially as a lot more people are going back to these jazz vocalists, especially Sarah Vaughn, especially Ella Fitzgerald? Yes, it's exciting. I, um, I don't know if I need this particular one. I'm probably gonna take a wait and see approach as well and hear what others say. Um, and so we'll, we'll kind of, uh, we'll see how that materializes. So I mentioned that the, uh, the vocalist thing extends from September into October. So who do we have in October? Um, well, it sounds like two. So on October 11th is Chet Baker's Baker's Holiday. This is being mastered by Ryan K. Smith. It was originally put out on Limelight. Is this like the first Limelight reissue ever? It isn't, but it's like, it's probably the first Limelight reissue in the, um, in the Acoustic Sounds series, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, so it was originally put out on Limelight in 1965. This one has gotten expensive lately, and it's because of all these folks who have gotten into, uh, into Chet Baker. Um, so the lineup on this is uh, Richard Davis, Connie Kay, Everett Barksdale, Hank Jones, and then like four Reed, four Reed players. Um, Chet Baker does play and he sings on this. And, um, and so I know that there's gonna be a lot of folks who are gonna want it for that. It also has a great cover and that brings in folks too. Um, and it hasn't had any modern US final reissues. So I suppose it's a good choice. I've listened to some of it and for me, I like, I like Chet Baker as early as possible. That's just kind of like what I, that's what I gravitate towards. And anything after, he almost has this like, he can have a little bit of a nasal quality to his singing and I don't get as much enjoyment out of it. But then like, then flash forward to like his, some of his last stuff where he sings and he kind of has like old man energy when he's singing and that's kind of endearing. Um, but this, <laughs> this mid period, I don't know. I, I'm probably gonna, uh, I'm probably gonna pass on this one. Um, so then coming up after that in October, in fact, on October 25th, Mel Torme, right? Responding to all the people who have been yelling, screaming for more Mel Torme. Uh, this one is simply titled Torme, um, mastered by Ryan K. Smith. It's originally released by Verve in 1959. This is maybe a $15 or $20 record, even for one in nice shape, um, but no modern vinyl reissues in the US. I, um, I do own some Mel Torme. In fact, I own some of his Bethlehem stuff. And I don't, it's not that I don't like Mel Torme, but um, some of his material I think lacks a little bit of soul or substance. And I just, um, you know, here, here's the thing. I got a little bit more into Johnny Hartman when Acoustic Sounds put out their reissues of some of his work. And, and I liked Johnny Hartman before, but I got more into him uh, when, when I heard that rendition. Is it possible that I'll get more into Mel Torme because Acoustic Sounds is putting their, theirs out? It is possible. Um, it's also possible that this particular release is one of his best, and I don't know that, but it's possible that if Chad Kasim wanted to prioritize it and bring it forward and it hasn't had any modern vinyl reissues, and so therefore nobody's paying attention to it, mostly because nobody's paying attention to Mel Torme, is it possible that there's like, you know, hidden treasure here? It is possible, but I don't know that I'm gonna go out and like pre-order it. So by the way, I know I'm probably annoying people, right? Because, um, because I'm saying like, oh, I'm not gonna get this, I'm not gonna get this. I know that every title is gonna have a group of fans behind it. And that's the reason why Acoustic Sounds is, is putting them out. And I'm sure that they're gonna sell all of them. It's just that, you know, I can't buy all 20 releases. Like I'm not, I'm not a completist with the series and you can't like everything. I'm prioritizing my purchases just like anybody else. It's just 
I'm addressing each of them and selling you whether I'm going to buy them or not. So I hope people I hope people don't get offended with just my own personal preferences. All right, so one one that you know that I'm going to be interested in um, is is this Ben Webster meets Oscar Peterson. This is coming out on November first. Uh, originally put out in 1959, and again one of those kind of meets you know series uh, kinds of things. So let's see. This one did have a reissue in 2012 in double. Uh, double 45 RPM format by Analog Productions. It's also been released by Speakers Corner in the past, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, you know, I think it's it's great to have a 33 RPM edition. So Ray Brown, Ed Thigpen, uh, Oscar, and Ben are on this, and I think uh, I think that's it. Is that it? Yeah. Um, and and here's the thing. I'm as you all know, I love Oscar Peterson. Um, I love Ben Webster. The fact that they're brought together here, I'm gonna have to. In fact, let me take a look and see the the uh, the condition of mine. Mine has some marks on it. So is that enough to make me get out of my original stereo? <sighs> Actually, I think it is because some of these are feelable. So yes. All right. So I'm, I'm. This is one of those Ben Webster titles that I'm probably gonna have to pick up because it is just impossible to find these early. You know these early 50 like late 50s and early 60s ben webster titles in decent shape because they were so well loved so this probably is one that i'm going to get um here's the thing it's yes i like ben webster and i like his playing a big part of the reason why i have energy for ben webster in audiophile format is because there's so much character to his playing he's very like breathy kind of tenor player and um, it incorporates so much emotion in his vibrato and like the sustains and everything. And it's always so beautiful. And I feel like these audiophile editions do such a great job of elevating some of that sonic detail. Now, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not the sort of person who's only looking for listening for the sonic detail. I'm listening to the music. Just when you have some of that, some of that detail that adds character and interest to the music, it that's like... That's the difference between listening music and saying this is fantastic, and listening to the music and getting goosebumps. And so um, I, I just find, I just find there'd be a lot to love with, uh, you know, that that merge of Ben Webster meets audiophile. I think is like uh, fantastic. All right, November fifteenth, we have more Ben Webster. I said that he was going to be present really throughout this entire calendar, and he really is. Um, so this is "See You at the Fair." This is the second impulse title for those who are counting. Um, See You at the Fair. This is being remastered by Ryan K. Smith. It was originally put out in this format on Impulse in 1964. Um, this was also put out by Analog Productions in 2012 in a double, uh, double 45 RPM format, so you know that Chad Kasim loves it. And I think for good reason. Um, the lineup is, uh, is Hank Jones, Roger Calloway. Uh, they must trade off on piano. And then you have Richard Davis and uh, Ossie or O.C. Johnson. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll say this, like, as much as I love Ben Webster and the fact that this is a Rudy Van Gelder release, right? Because it's, uh, it's Impulse and he did almost all of them. It isn't one of my favorite Ben Webster titles, but it is, um, but it's still Ben Webster and it's, uh, and it's great music. Um, I think, I think one thing maybe to pay attention to here, and maybe one of the reasons why I'm not as much of a fan of this title as much as others, is that there's a lot more short format tracks here. So, um, the, uh, the first side has a little bit longer format with, um, like two four minute songs, a six minute song, and then one that's only two and change. But on the second side, there's one, two, three, four tracks that are under three minutes. And then you have one track that's uh, that's four. So it is a little bit of a more, you know, it just has like a little bit more of a commercial feel to it, I'd say. And maybe that's the reason. Whereas I tend to like it when Ben Webster has more sort of lengthy statements and then, you know, maybe trade solos with like piano or, or maybe some of these other folks in these meets formats where there's other, um, you know, whether there's like a trumpeter or whether there's a, another uh, saxophonist, something like that. So I tend to prefer some of those other ones, but it's still Ben Webster and it's Impulse. And um, for those of you who haven't heard it, I mean, you know, it's going to be a great opportunity to, uh, to finally pick it up. All right, so even though Blue Note has been dragging their heels a little bit on reissuing Jimmy Smith, that has not scared uh, Chad Kasim away from doing it because in December, we have two titles, the first on the 6th and the second on the 13th. So um, here's the problem, is that if it's in this series, you know it's a Verve title because Jimmy Smith didn't have anything on Impulse. And uh, Jimmy Smith on Verve is not really, at least traditionally, the most compelling music. 
So what do we have? Well, on the, on the 6th, December 6th, we have the cats. And then on the 13th, we have root down. Um, and I happen to have a copy of root down here. I do not own a copy of the cats, although I have, uh, I have in the past. So um, both originally on Verve, Chad didn't say in his video anything about the mastering for these. So I, um, in some of these, he, he didn't. He, he just kind of either avoided it or um, neglected to mention it. So let me address the cat, uh, the cat first. The cat is not really a desirable record in its original format. Um, but Root Down, by contrast, really is and may be the best album that Jimmy Smith ever put out. And it just so happens that it's a live format. Um, so I don't even want to talk about the cat. I don't like the cat. I, I, um, I, I don't think some, some of my problems with Jimmy Smith's music, um, I think, are, are more elevated there. And I just think that um, sometimes like the density of his playing and the fact that he doesn't um, sort of enable others to kind of step in and take away from some of that density and add a little bit of space, I just, um, it, it, it wears on me. And it's difficult for me to listen to The Cat in its entirety. And, and this is an album that just like, you used to be able to go to Half Price Books and find this for a dollar all day and all night. And when I say like, I mean, you could go to any half price books and some of some of those locations would even have multiple copies of it for a dollar. So it just, it hasn't been very desirable. And I don't know that it being included in acoustic sound series is enough to convince me otherwise. Maybe I will go and revisit it and listen to it through sort of my ears today and, and figure out if maybe something has changed, but um, in, in terms of how I process it, but probably not. And so I'm probably going to avoid the cat. Um, that's just my opinion. But on the other hand, Root Down, and despite the fact that I've got, look at this, it's a DJ uh, not for sale copy. This is fantastic. And, and if, if so many of the things in the cat are like what I don't like about Jimmy, there's a lot here that I really like about Jimmy. So um, in the lineup, we have Paul Humphrey on drums. You have Wil Wilton Felder on bass, right? So Jimmy Smith not playing the bass line as he often does. You've got congas and percussion by Buck Clark. You've got guitar by Arthur Adams, harmonica by Steve Williams. So what, what you can already tell is that there's a greater number of players, more distribution of the playing, and not just Jimmy, you know, with these like dense reverberating like organ chords or something. And like, you know, just, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't want to, I don't want to put him down too much because there are a lot of albums that I really like about, of, uh, of Jimmy Smith's, especially when he is paired with a, uh, with a saxophonist, right? Um, but outside of that, I don't, particularly like him in a trio format, uh, but this one is different. And I encourage folks who, uh, who otherwise sort of looks uh, you know, sideways at, uh, at Jimmy Smith, I'd encourage you to at least preview this. This has not had any modern vinyl reissues in the US um, and, and you know, it was put out in 1972 and it's kind of been ignored. So I think that it's definitely time for a reissue and original copies of this have uh, have gone you know for for quite a bit of money probably at least up to a hundred dollars maybe more than that haven't checked lately but it's definitely a desirable record in its original form and so therefore I think there's gonna be a ready sort of audience to pounce on this thing once it's made available all right so there you have it everyone you've heard about each of the 20 titles and you've heard some of my thoughts including which ones I'm probably going to get and if I can think about what I said across this video the high-level summary is Soulville, I think is a great release, probably going to get it. Um, let's see, let's see, Billie Holiday, Body and Soul, I think is another excellent one. That's a, a top pick. Jerry Mulligan meets Ben Webster is another. Stan Getz's Sweet Rain is yet another. And then, you know, so Ben Webster meets Oscar Peterson because my copy is in not in great shape. And then the question is, would I want to get another copy of Root Down? I don't know. And probably the jury's out on a few of these other ones, but <clears throat> but um, those are those are kind of my top picks. Would be curious, I, I suppose, to know what other people are most interested in, because it's very likely that some of you have a lot more experience with some of these albums that I don't have as much experience with. And so if you have recommendations that you think I should add to my sort of list of ones to, uh, to check out and or pre-order, please let me know in the comments. So thanks everyone for sticking with me and stay tuned in the very near future for a rundown of the Record Store Day 2024 titles. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you next time.